Hello and welcome. This is Perry Roberts, uh, your host for today from DMAI, and we are the Trade Association for Convention and Visitors Bureaus. And we're so glad to have you here for our webinar this morning. We've uh, borrowed a little question from our buddy Will Shakespeare here to CBB or not to CBB. And uh, that's the question we posed this morning. And we look forward to uh, providing you, hopefully, with some great answers in the affirmative to that question. So before we get started, I'd just like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via our question board. We have Christine Shimasaki from DMEI. Um, Shimo is monitoring questions this morning, so please type them in. Um, she'll be happy to compile them and, and be sure to ask our panelists at the end. So this morning we're headed down um, hopefully an opportunity to tell you more about the promise of the CBB industry and also what specific value they bring to the meeting planning equation and um, talk to you really about how to better leverage um, your relationship with your CBB partners. Um, for today we are really excited to have our guest today, Gary Sherwin, who is DMAI board chair and also the president and CEO of Visit Newport Beach. Good morning, Gary. How are you? Terrific, Terry. Good morning to you and to all of our webinar guests. Uh, it's great to have you here. Gary has a, a pretty great uh, career, 24-year industry veteran from which he speaks prior to being uh, the president and CEO at Visit Newport Beach. He was out in the desert in Palm Springs, California. He also um, is a graduate of State, um, California State Fullerton, and he's on that school's uh, Wall of Fame uh, in 2000 and serves also on their adjunct faculty. He is an instructor also with DMAI's CBME brand and positioning course, and he is president of the vice president of the Orange County Travel uh, Tourism Council and second vice chair of California Travel Industry Association Board of Directors. So Gary, thank you so much for um, welcoming our attendees today and sharing your insights with them. But before we get to Gary, um, we would like to welcome Adam Sachs um, in our effort to kind of continually give you, our listeners, our planners, the best information to make really good informed decisions in any destination in which you take a meeting. We'd ask Adam to join us for uh, a brief um, economy and meetings outlook for 2017 to kick off the year. So we are excited um, to have Adam with you. Good morning, Adam. How are you? Doing well, thanks. Good morning. Good afternoon. So I'm going to um, give keyboard and mouse to you, Adam, so that you can go through your slide and uh, share your outlook with our folks. Very good. All right, so uh, just in a few minutes, I'm going to give you our view of uh, where we think the, the economy and the lodging market overall in the U.S. is going. And I think as a starting point, it bears mentioning that the past six years have been unusual. Uh, why is that? Well, it's primarily because it's been such a good period of time. If you look back over the last 20 years, there's been no steady period of time where room demand has grown faster than GDP except for these past six years. And you can see that in each of the past six years, uh, room demand in the U.S. has grown faster than real GDP. And we've got no analog for that over the last 20 years. So this has been unusually good and, and, uh, and so we've enjoyed this as an industry. Um, at the same time, while demand has been rising, supply has been relatively well under control and so occupancy has hit uh, new peaks. Uh, in the second quarter of 2016. Now, while that's fallen off a bit, uh, in the longer context, um, times are still very, very good in terms of occupancy rates. And so RevPAR, not surprisingly, also has hit new peaks, uh, well above its prior peak in 2007. And I think behind this, it's instructive to think about how our how are people behaving? And uh, one way to, to think about that is in terms of how many hotel rooms does the average person consume? And, and what you see is that over the last 30 years, there's been a steady upward trend of how much individuals actually stay in hotel rooms. So that room nights per capita 
is what we're showing. But you can see that it's gone above that long run trend over the last couple of years and does stand at a new peak as well. So there's been this behavioral shift that's been ongoing, but an acceleration of that over the last couple of years. And that's really what's been driving some of this exceptional performance. Okay. So in, in summary, what are we looking at for the, the consumer market, particularly the leisure demand? Uh, uh, let me go back one slide. Uh, a number of factors are weighing on this, uh, it, mostly in a good sense. So we've got steady job growth and income growth following behind with the unemployment rate below 5% and income uh, really beginning to get traction. At the same time, consumer confidence remains relatively buoyant and household balance sheets are also in a good position both on the asset side and on the liability side. All of this should give uh, wind in the sails of consumers in 2017 and therefore to leisure travel. And if you look at the same thing on the corporate side, you get a, a more mixed view of the outlook for business travel and, and for group. And so we've got anemic global demand for exports, um, an energy market slowdown, a, a general wave of uncertainty that we're facing right now, especially uh, with the current presidential administration, and then tightening bank standards. All of this beginning to weigh on corporate investment and also on business travel. And so you, you get uh, out of that a fairly subdued outlook. So whereas GDP grew at a uh, extremely modest 1.6% uh, last year, we do expect it to pick up uh, and move into the mid twos over the next couple of years, but still uh, not, uh, not kind of the target 3% that policymakers would sometime mention. We don't think that is in reach. Um, it gives us two different views of travel propensity, um, and that is that the transient side continues to show strength, whereas the group and contract side is showing general weakness. And just looking at uh, indexing both to 2010, you can see the transient has continued to forge ahead through 2016 while group and transient has leveled off. And it's really a reflection of the, the different, differing strengths between the, uh, the consumer side of the economy and the corporate side of the economy. Uh, the big policy uncertainty is, of course, uh, what policies the Trump administration is going to under, undertake. You could really view this as a glass half full, glass half empty. Uh, on the positive side, you do have tax cuts, uh, more infrastructure spending and less regulation, all on the policy docket. But at the same time, you've got uh, a tremendous amount of uncertainty in trade protectionism, uh, uh, an anti-immigration policy that would be uh, uh, anti-growth, and, uh, and, and the specter of spending cuts as well that uh, would reduce economic growth. And then this overall risk of uh, what has been borne out to be a trial and error presidency in the first month. Um, so where does that, that take us? That, that uncertainty noted is that, that we do expect uh, room demand to fall back in line with GDP. And so um, in 2017, room demand of just 1.5% growth, which is actually going to be below room supply growth, which tells us that occupancy is going to fall. So we shouldn't be surprised that room demand is going to soften as we get in further into this year and even to next year. Um, that's really returning to what the, the normal relationship has been between the economy and what's going on in room activity. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, supply here in the blue bars this year begins to outpace demand uh, just by a bit. And so we will continue to see falling occupancies. And then, and so with that, there will be rate challenges. Um, but given that uh, you know, we've had had some good gains there, the overall performance of the hotel industry should still be solid. And therefore, rep par is going to be entirely related to rate, uh, while occupancy uh, does struggle over the next two years. Um, but the, uh, the this is not a hard landing by by any means. And uh, um, given that supply has been relatively well controlled by capital markets. Uh, we, we'd expect RevPAR to continue to grow, uh, but simply not at the rates that we had uh, perhaps grown too accustomed to in uh, prior years. So, so Adam, you, you see maybe our planners getting just a tad bit of relief from the hotel being completely in the driver's seat, but still a very healthy marketplace. That, that's right. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be a little bit of a tougher sell, uh, but uh, you know, it's a it's a market that is still in a generally good place. So we're not, we're not seeing crisis ahead. That's great, Adam. Thank you so much for joining us and kind of giving us that brief overview as, as we start 
our webinar season. And before we get started with Gary, we'd like to just launch a couple of polls to find out who um, is on the call with us today. So you can go to your um, dashboard and answer the question, what types of meetings or what type of meeting planner are you? And we would love to hear from you. Um, and you can vote by saying whether you plan meetings in the corporate market, the association market, um, other, or third-party planner. Thank you all for getting in there and voting. If you haven't, try to do it quickly because we're going to close the poll. And I'll share the poll with Gary and, and the rest of the audience. So you can see that we're leading a little bit by association planners, uh, about half, and then uh, corporate also. And then we have um, our industry partners on with us as well. I'd like to, um, Gary, then ask a, a second question of the planners on the line with us. How many meetings a year do you plan and give you an opportunity to vote, whether it's between 1 and 5, 5 and 10, 10 to 20, or whether you plan 20 plus meetings a year. Everybody's still voting. We'll close that out now. And I'll share it with you. So it looks like the vast majority, majority of you joining us today are pretty busy planning 20 or more meetings per year. We'll ask you to Tell us now, what is the size of the largest meeting that you plan during the year? And again, selection between 50 or 1,000 or more rooms on peak. Thank you for getting your votes in. We'll close that poll, and I'll share it with you now. So it looks like the math, uh, the math, the uh, mass majority of you are right there kind of in the middle, if you will, planning uh, meetings of 100 to 500 rooms on peak. And then last, certainly not a trick question, but we'd like for you to um, tell us currently, do you generally involve your CVB in the planning of your meeting um, from the beginning? And go ahead and vote now. And we'll close out the poll. And Gary, I think this gives us a, a good idea that um, we're happy to see that, again, the majority are including their CVB from the beginning of the planning process, um, but that, that down at the bottom, only 6 percent of, of those surveyed are saying they're including the CBB if they're not working with an NSO or a GSO, and 35% um, saying only if they are unfamiliar with the destination. So I think that's some interesting um, input from you, our audience, as we begin to ask Gary some questions. So Gary, I guess I'll start with my first question. Um, in, I guess, honor of the title of the webinar is sort of why CBB. I guess planners often contend in this world of internet search that there's not much you can't find online. But I know we always urge planners to contact the CBB first. So sometimes does this feel a little manipulative, like we would just want them to reach out to us so we get credit for the meeting in our destination. But can you tell them why it's really important to contact the CBB before they enter the destination. Great. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. I know we have a bit of a diverse audience here. Um, we have some full-time planners, we have third parties, we have some administrative folks, and of course a lot of people from our industry who have uh, kind of tuned in with us today. I think if you're a planner, uh, and it doesn't matter whether um, you are full-time or a third party or you do this as part of many tasks that you do for your organization, you do share kind of a common goal, and that is you want to be a hero at the end of the day. You want to look good. You want to make sure that uh, you have a productive and engaging meeting. You want it to be financially successful. You don't want to obviously overspend. Um, and if you have vendors that are attending your meeting, you want them to be happy because that's important possibly to your bottom line. And you want it to be logistically smooth um, as possible, whether 
it's at the hotel or with ground transportation, air transport, or off-site venues. And that's really the sweet spot, I think, where DMOs can really be your knowledgeable resource. Uh, because at the end of the day, when you're planning a meeting of any size, um, you really want that timely inside knowledge, um, given the unique demands of your meeting. And um, be it space, location, the property, um, a DMO is really here to help you make sure that your overall experience uh, is an exceptional one. And we know the destination better than anybody else. We live it every day. We know all of its quirks. We know its great strengths. We know the things that uh, are important to you and things that will help you make uh, yourself look good in front of the people you need to look good in front of. So we can do a lot of things. Certainly, um, you know, we can help you craft your RFP. Um, we can explain all the options within the destination that are available to you. Uh, we can save you time and knowledge, frankly, that you can't get elsewhere. I mean, the web is wonderful. There are some phenomenal resources out there. But let's face it, the, the little things that make a big difference aren't always available online. And that's really where a DMO or a CVB can really help you, help you out and give you that uh, insight that's going to really uh, set you apart and, and make you look good, particularly if you're not familiar with the destination. And I know even a number of people said, well, you know, if I'm not familiar with the destination, I'll use it. Uh, sometimes I always use the DMO. We always say, even if you are familiar with the destination, it's always great to use the DMO because destinations change, they evolve. There are new options, there are new opportunities for you, things that you haven't discovered even if you've been to the destination many times. And also, let's face it, occasionally problems arise uh, in the planning of a meeting. And sometimes it involves a hotel, sometimes it involves, you know, uh, contractual issues, sometimes it's off-sites, and that's really where a DMO can be of greatest value to you, is to be your advocate, to help you out, to help uh, problem shoot, and deal with some of the things that invariably come up, even if it's with a hotel. We can also help be that intermediary, we can be the troubleshooter, we know ways to be able to kind of navigate things to help you look good and to have a successful meeting. Yeah, Gary, when, I, when you talk about um you know, you can find almost anything that sometimes is the subtleties. It makes me think about sometimes when I'm searching online, the only thing I can't find is just someone to talk to. And um, I want to ask you about that first bullet, which is educate um, spanners on destination demand factors. So would your salespeople routinely share uh, with planners things like the seasonality of the destination or citywide or even need dates in the destination, do they have access to that kind of destination demand? Because that's something that a planner isn't going to be able to find online. And are they sharing it, or can planners expect for this sort of demand intelligence to be shared with them? Absolutely. I mean, I think a, a great DMO uh, really understands uh, what is going on in the community. They understand uh, what is going on with the hotels. They understand uh, a, a real thorough understanding of what's going on with the destination to really interpret it, explain it, advise, counsel, and and to uh, kind of work you through some of these various issues. Again, you're not going to always find it at a hotel. You're not going to always find it at a uh, uh, online. That DMO gives you that kind of thirty thousand foot perspective that sometimes is so critical when you're deciding whether or not you're going to plan a meeting on a certain month or a certain week. And we are here to be, you know, your uh, advisor at, through this entire process is, um, you know, when it, we talk about some of the other things that we've got, um, you know, you know, we, I mentioned earlier about the subtleties of a destination, knowing places that you haven't heard about, off-sites, hot restaurants. Uh, even places that are off the grid. You know, here in town, we even have luxury homes uh, that aren't Airbnb, but they're special event venues, but they're not necessarily marketed. But we know about them, and we know the owners, and sometimes we can go and say, listen, here's an opportunity for you to have a really special venue that, um, that we have a contact with that we can uh, work with you on and get you in there and provide that really different, you know, truly exceptional 
uh, experience that uh, will really set your meeting apart. So Gary, I'd like to kind of ask you um, maybe to go through the specific types of services um, that planners could expect to gain from their CVB counterparts. Well, you know, I, I mentioned the you know site inspections. Site inspections are so important. Um, again, even if you've been to a destination in the last few years, it's important to go and be able to check it out, understand what's going on. Hotels change, flags change. Um, there's new air service. Um, there's new experiences in, in downtown areas and such. You really want to be able to uh, be able to understand that. And a DMO, first of all, listens to what your concerns are. First and foremost, we want to know what your hot buttons are. We want to know what is it going to take uh, to make you successful, what's going to uh, differentiate your meeting. We want to really customize our presentation and our uh, engagement with you based on your greatest needs. Uh, we're very customer focused and I think that is you know, one of the important things to consider. I mentioned about unique off-site and, and venues. We can help you um, with attendance as well and be able to uh, do some attendance builders wherever we can. This third point, uh, which I think is a really important point, and that is um, there are times when you come into a destination and perhaps you're going to want to maybe close off a street, perhaps you're going to um, want access to a park, maybe you're going to need to use a beach, you never know. Um, you're going to sometimes need an advocate that's going to have to maybe work with local authorities, maybe the police, maybe uh, working with City Hall, working with permits, um, things that you're going to need an advocate on the ground to be able to help uh, get you around and secure those uh, particular uh, venues for you. That's what we do. We know the people who uh, can help you so that you can uh, get through some of these hurdles that you know, occasionally uh, do uh, pop up with, with meetings. We've seen it many times where people want to close off a block or something and somehow everyone goes nuts or you have to wait an extra long period for a permit process. Um, we're your champions. We know how to be able to make those kind of things happen for you. A real specific example, I had a planner tell me um, at an industry event of several months ago that she at a last minute got a, a request from their CEO to have flags from all of the countries in which um, their attendees were coming from. And so she's on Amazon trying to buy, you know, flags at the last minute, thought to pick up the phone, have a conversation with her CBB services person who got in contact with the mayor's office who knew in, uh, as part of the mayor's office um, protocol, uh, all those flags are right there in the destination and were delivered to her meeting within, you know, an hour. So again, it's, it's that contact. Um, but speak to that third um, bullet. I know that many um, of the planners online are comfortable with um, CVBs or DMOs giving them access to things like restaurants or art or cultural events, but what about really helping planners tap into the intellectual capital, the business resources, um, good rich things um, to lend to the actual content of their meeting, people that are like-minded in their destinations, Gary, how, how do you act as a conduit for that? Well, because we really know our destination so well and we know you know, so many of the influential players and we know the business leaders and, and we know the people who uh, live and work in this community that really sometimes provide an interesting local perspective. Um, we, can, we can do a lot, a lot of that. Um, case in point, um, we've got uh, a uh, major state group that's going to be coming to town in June and uh, you know, basketball legend Kobe Bryant lives here in town um, and he is literally down the hall as we speak shooting a, a spot for this group to welcome them to Newport Beach. Um, and he did that because he happened to be able to know us and we asked on behalf of the group. So those kind of things that you're not necessarily going to be able to get just um, without using a DMO, you're going to the DMO really has their finger on the pulse of the community to be able to bring those unique assets in really to work for your benefit. Yeah, it's cool. I just got back from Chicago, our CMA, and uh, the planners there were really excited about how Choose Chicago had set up 
educational tours into uh, four separate um, parishes and um, really got them to see some behind the scenes, back of the house kinds of things that they would have never got to see um, in Chicago. So I think, again, you're, you really uh, make a good point that it's all about accessing what might be a little bit off the grid. So Gary, I can't let you off the hook uh, without um, asking you to address perhaps some pretty common misconceptions about working with CBBs. There's some things that continue even in 2017 to plague our industry. So I wonder if you might speak to um, some myths or misperceptions, if you will, uh, that some planners might still hold about working with their CBB or their DMO partners. Well, I was happy to see on the poll that uh, there are a lot of folks who have tuned in today that um, don't uh, necessarily use a, a DMO just for conventions. Uh, because yeah, certainly, if you need to use a convention center, you, you, you need a DMO very often uh, to be able to navigate that for you, and that's an obvious one. But I think, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of the planners here who, who have sort of an interesting sweet spot of two to five hundred rooms very often. That's self-contained pieces of business. And I'll, you know, speak uh, on, on our own behalf here in Newport Beach. Um, we have eight properties. We do not have a convention center and we have five full-time dedicated exceptionally talented salespeople who navigate um, and, and work with our uh, with our customers and our clients with our hotels for self-contained pieces of business. And I think um, that is one of the things sometimes people forget is, well, I'm just bringing a couple hundred room nights, I'll just call the hotel and work it out okay. myself. And um, many of our, many, I know uh, that's, that's all we do and that's how a lot of destinations do it. Even our friends up in Anaheim, which have a huge convention center, they have people that, you know, sell individual hotels. So in big cities, small cities, um, our job is to, you know, just work with you in whatever capacity, in whatever size group. Um, it doesn't have to be a citywide. It can, it can be a small group and, and we really will be here to help you. Um, the important thing I think to note, and, and it really validates all these points on the slide, and that is DMOs really, I think, have evolved over the last few years, and we have very much of a customer-centric mentality now. The fact is that we don't exist and we can't prosper unless you, the planning community, are successful. Um, yes, we may have members, but the fact is our members uh, will not be happy unless they have business, and you're the people who bring business, and so we have to put your interests first. So if, if you are coming into a community and you want to know um, that, hey, I've got a piece of business, I don't want to be bombarded by uh, a bunch of leads, tell the DMO. That's fine. It certainly isn't our pro uh, policy to always you know, blast everything automatically. We want to first hear from the customer. What does the customer want? If they want to hear from everyone, we're more than happy to do that. If they just want to talk to about a couple of hotels and that's all they want to talk about, well, we'll ask them, well, have you considered these others because they might meet your needs, but if they don't, then we will respect that. And then we will then go ahead and send it to us to the people who uh, you want to get the lead to. So, you know, it, um, we don't do that. Um, we are very respectful. And again, we want to make sure that your engagement with us is a really positive one. Um, because we want you to come back. At the end of the day, we want you to be not only happy with your um, business and, and your experience with us, but that you'll come back and, and bring other business or bring repeat business to us. And we do work with all kinds of folks. I know in our office we have very good relationships with the third-party planners. Um, we, you know, we go, in fact, we're sponsors on a lot of these groups. We will work with any group we'll, um, in terms of uh, collaborating. Depends on whatever your, your needs are. And, uh, of course, we don't charge for our services to planners. We exist to serve the customer. And if we do that well, then uh, the business will come and then everyone here in town will be just happy and delighted. But um, we have to put your interests first. So know that um, while we may have some members or, members or stakeholders, we are very respectful of that. And I think that whole uh, customer first mentality is, is really sort of the driving force uh, for our industry right now. 
Well, Gary, well said on, on all of those points, and I'd just like for you to clarify, because I know it's a mystery, um, and we say our services are free, but in fact they're not, because nothing is free. Um, you know, our services are funded, um, and they're free to planners. So maybe you can just sort of um, summarize by telling our planners how CVBs are generally funded in the destinations in which they serve. Well, DMOs are very unique beasts, um, and it, uh, they, are funded, <laughs> they are funded differently uh, and organized differently. The vast majority of them, though, are private, nonprofit organizations uh, that are governed by a board of directors. They usually have a contract uh, with their respected uh, community. There are still some government-operated uh, DMOs, and there are some that are operating through chambers of commerce. The vast majority of them, though, are private nonprofit, and as such, um, I think they are. Um, it's really a specialized form of economic development. But I think what you what you see with a lot of DMOs is even though they are nonprofits, and I know that's a mantra here in our office, is that nonprofit is a tax status only. Um, we are very entrepreneurial in how we approach things. We understand what um, you know. Again, we're trying to bring business in. We try to be um, very creative on how we work with you uh, we, and how the hotels uh, work. We like to consider ourselves an extension of everything that goes on with a hotel. So when a hotel is working with you, they will bring us in and together we will team up to be able to help best service uh, what you're trying to do. We do not embrace bureaucracy. Uh, you know, we like to be, um, again, uh, creative on how we approach things because we know that that's every every client wants something a little bit different they have different needs they have a different demands they have different experiences they have different expectations and we have to be able to be able to manage that but you have to bring that almost private sector entrepreneurial spirit and thinking to the table when you're meeting with with folks and I think that's you know that's critical of, of what we do um, we like to think you know that we we have an understanding of your mindset and what uh, is important to you, and um, and you know and also the important thing I think more than anything else is if you're not working with DMOs very often I think planners leave money on the table. Um, you know working with the DMO um, actually works to your financial advantage because we know the things that can help save you money. We have resources that can, you know, we very often can bring to the table to make your job easier. Um, we know where the hotel's, you know, pain points are so that we can help give you that insight. So if you're doing it alone, very often, um, you know, you don't have some of the insight and expertise and, again, resources that we can help uh, bring that will help you on the bottom line as well as just make you successful overall. Yeah, Gary, I think that's a really compelling call to action to involve your, your CVB and your DMO. And I thank you um, for spending your time with us. I know um, Shima's been collecting some questions for you, so we'll get to those in just a couple of minutes here real quickly. Um, if you are interested in finding um, your contact at Newport Beach or any of our other destinations, empowerment.com is CMAI's website to help planners uh, be able to find all of the DMOs vested in the meetings marketplace in one easy resource. And if you're a Washington, D.C.-based planner or someone who can commute easily and want to meet your DMO sales professionals on the ground and in person, we invite you to Destination Showcase um, coming up uh, just in a couple of weeks here. So look forward to that. I know many of you will be curious about getting your CMP credit for today's webinar, you've gained a half an hour in Domain H of Site Management. Uh, it'll come out to you next week, probably midweek since there's a holiday on Monday. Um, but please um, do make sure that you check your spam because we find that it often ends up there. I'd like to, while uh, Shimo collects our questions for Gary, I'd like to really thank um, our sponsors, MPI and ePro Direct. Chris Wessel from ePro is such a great uh, advocate and sponsor of our industry. Chris, how are you today? I am great. Thank you so much for uh, our continued partnership, Terry. Terry we really, really appreciate it. Um, 
just a quick uh, overview of kind of who we are. Uh, we, we just actually celebrated our 15-year anniversary as a marketing agency servicing the meetings and uh, uh, convention segments of the hospitality industry. Um, we offer, uh, well, I guess over the last 15 years, we've been helping hotels, resorts, and destinations grow their uh, group business by marketing their content and their messages to our a database of about 80,000 uh, qualified meeting planner subscribers. Um, and we also help conference organizers uh, market their events, uh, primarily through uh, uh, some pretty significant email marketing efforts, but to market their events to help them uh, grow their group attendance. So if anyone has any questions, anybody that's on the webinar that's uh, you know, either a destination or potentially a hotel uh, that's looking to connect with our database of, of meeting planners, they can feel free to reach out to me. And if there are any planners that are on the call that need help uh, growing their event attendance, um, that's something we've become pretty uh, savvy at as well. So um, you can reach me at Chris uh, dot Wezel, that's W-E-Z-E-L at eprodirect.com, or you can just simply go to eprodirect.com and check us out there. Thanks so much. And uh, Gary, great information. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed Adam's uh, state of the industry, too. That, that's, that's awesome information. Thank you. Yes. It's good to get that quick snapshot. And, and Gary, great job. Shimo, sure um, I think Shimo's on with us. Oh, here she comes. Hey, she. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, we've had a really uh, great Q&A uh, board going uh, during your presentation, Gary. It's, uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, but, you know, originally when we first started, we had several planners kind of reach out and say, is there a difference between a DMO and a CVB? And I'm wondering whether you can address that. Well, it's, you know, changing terms. I think that, um, you know, the the... The, the terminology is, has been under debate now for quite a while. I think that within our industry, we probably, and most of the planners know the term CDB. I think if you go outside our industry and you say CDB, um, people think it's some cardioventricle thing or something along those lines. <laughs> um, they don't really know what a CDB stood for. And I think uh, we've evolved over the last few years, and now I think a lot of the, the common term is DMO, or Destination Marketing Organization, because certainly we do work with planners and we book business, but we also have a, a larger responsibility to market and tell the overall destination story and to try to uh, tell the brand and uh, to kind of expand the overall awareness of our community. So our responsibilities have evolved and changed, and I think the name is somewhat reflective of it, but it still doesn't change essentially what we do, which is uh, particularly on the sales side, working with planners to make them successful. Oh, well put. Uh, so DMO, CDB could be used interchangeably. Yes, um, absolutely. We had uh, several corporate planners um, come on the uh, webinar today with us who really haven't worked with the CDB and actually would like to know how they can kind of convince their, uh, their stakeholders of using the CDB. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, the one slide that we put up about the, the reasons why to use the CVB was excellent, and they actually asked for that slide. But I think that fundamentally, um, what would you say are like three key points to really be able to explain to the stakeholders, if you're in a corporation, about why you want to use the CVB? Well, I, I think, you know, to recap a couple points I made, I think that the fact that if you're, if you're a corporation and you're coming into a, a community, obviously uh, you're going to be spending money. You want to make sure that it's a wise investment. Um, you want to make sure that um, you know what you're getting into. You want to know uh, what's happening with the hotel. You want to know, um, you know, is the, is the uh, hotel going to be changing its flag? Are they going to be doing renovations? Are they going to be um, offering some new amenities? Are there some new things going on in the, in the community that you're not necessarily going to get from any other source? And that's why, again, having that DMO, being able to give you that 30,000 foot kind of global perspective on the destination and then helping you navigate it is just good business. And, and I, again, reemphasize, if you're doing this alone and you're not going to be able to find everything you need online and you end up 
spending perhaps more than you want to spend. I know corporations don't like to do that. You want to be able to come to a community and spend wisely, get good value for your dollar, and be able to be successful at the end of the day. And uh, you need somebody who can be your champion and help sort things out and help you navigate and, and uh, make you a hero and most successful in, in, in front of your, uh, your, your board, your supervisor, whoever. Um, a DML is a great counselor. I mean, I don't think most corporations would end up doing their taxes without getting, uh, you know, a tax advisor. They certainly would make legal issues without getting lawyers involved. You're not going to want to make many decisions without getting a DMO involved because we offer that same level of expertise in our field. And I think also, too, um, that I've often heard planners say is that the DMO really operates as the eyes and ears you know, here locally when the planner can't be here locally to really be informed about changes that are occurring that might impact their program. So thank you, Gary. Um, now, do we had one question come in that do DMOs in other countries, do they operate differently than the DMOs here in the U.S. or Canada? Uh, they do, and sometimes they're structured differently. I know a lot of DMOs uh, internationally, many of them separate their leisure from their group marketing, um, and in many cases they are uh, government-owned uh, or operated, um, and so they do have some different rules that they, they abide by, but they still want to make sure that they're customer-centric and they want to be able to work with you. Um, they, you know, the, uh, particularly in a lot of these countries that have separate dedicated convention sales efforts uh, that are separate apart from everything else that DMO may do, um, they're, you know, they, they want to be able to engage with the, uh, with the planner. They want to be able to do the same things they do here in the United States and be able to kind of learn what, uh, what you need and, and how they can best help with you. So again, their structure may be a little different, um, but the mentality and the goals are still the same. I'd like to address this uh, next question to Terry. We have a planner who works with an annual association, and, and that client you know, uh, rotates their uh, meeting around. And, and they're really sourcing you know, two to three uh, destinations uh, when they're looking um, in any given year. And rather than having to reach out individually and kind of say the same spiel to um, individual CVBs, is there a way that uh, this planner can communicate um, kind of similar to, she's asking, it's similar to a, a GSO kind of a process? Yeah, I saw that question. It's a good one. Um, the industry does not have a GSO or a, a group of sales representatives that uh, represent or rep multiple cities, but that really is one of the functions of our website, uh, which you see listed there at empowerment.com. So you can go, you could select several cities of interest. Um, so maybe you're looking at you know, Newport and Anaheim and San Diego and LA, and you can put them all in uh, one bucket and then send out a question, a quick question, a response to them, or you could even upload and send out your RFP to all the destinations simultaneously. So it is an opportunity to get your information in the hands of multiple destinations at the same time. And even if you don't want to source um, your uh, RFP through empowerment or source it, I, I saw questions, uh, Shimo, in the box about C events, or maybe I don't want to source my um, meeting, or I don't want to source my RFP through the DMO, do I still get in contact with them anyway? And and my, I guess I jump in and say absolutely. You know, get in contact with them for all the things that Gary was saying. Even if you're going to source it through CVent, make sure that you copy your DMO, um, and make sure that, I always say before you hit send is the best time. You know, even if you're going to send it separately, send it in another way, before you hit send, have a conversation, and then they may be able to alert you to pitfalls or opportunities, like Gary was saying, oh, you should think about this, or you're going to get really frustrated that week because there's a big citywide, or there's a marathon going on in the destination, and traffic is going to be really cumbersome, or maybe a simple change in arrival departure could garner you 
um, you know, we always say are you flexible, but a simple arrival departure change of a day or two could save you, you know, forty, fifty, sixty dollars in a destination. Those are all things, intelligence that you could get up front before you hit send. I think that are really beneficial, no matter what size you're you're meeting. And Chimo, the other thing I wanted to add too, uh, along those lines, is that if you look at the dynamics of what's happening right now in the hotel industry. Um, you're seeing fewer uh, hotel companies actually have on-site salespeople. Um, now we're going to more regionalized sales approach, and that works well for a lot of these companies, and it's it's very effective for them. But if you are a planner and you need to know what's happening at a specific hotel, um, that regional sales team may or may not have all the expertise that they need on that particular property because they're also charged with maybe representing a whole region um, that they have to have some general working knowledge of. And that is a very different dynamic than perhaps 10 years ago where you had somebody who was living and breathing on a property every single day. So that really puts more of a burden on the DMO to be able to offer more of that insight. And a lot of these sale, regional sales teams, they work terrific, but it's different than if you're living and breathing in a destination versus being in, perhaps in an adjoining city or another city several miles away and not seeing what's going on in the destination and the, and the property on a daily basis. And that's why we can offer value to you. You know, Gary have talked um, about you know why CDBs can really provide their services for free, and you know, we're in, but I know that in the back of uh, the planners' minds, it is you know. So what's the catch? So we had one planner that says, "I have never uh, really worked with a CDB because my association assumes that I'll get a commission that will really impact the cost." Uh, can we clarify that once and for all? Uh, I, I do not know any DMOs that get commissions off any pieces of business. Um, most of the way DMOs are traditionally funded is that they get a dedicated percentage of the hotel room tax uh, or you know a flat fee uh, for their services. There's now a thing called tours and business improvement districts that are very popular here in California and now they're kind of going across the country um, where there is a, a percentage of uh, that's tacked on to all the rooms in the destination or specific property as part of a, uh, an assessment and that very often goes back to the DMO. But if you're bringing a, a, a group into a, a community, there is no direct financial benefit uh, to the DMO uh, other than when you come to town and you leave money behind, very often the DMO will share in that benefit through the city, which then gives the money to the DMO because you've you know, paid your tax or assessment or what have you. But it, it is, our, our services, um, are, we're not incentivized to steer you in a direction because of a certain specific return or benefit that we're going to enjoy. Our job, again, is to just get you in our communities, to book you in your communities and make sure you're happy and satisfied and successful so that you'll come back again. I say that I had a government planner um, kind of echo what Gary said earlier. I had a government planner say that her boss insists that she use the DMO because he feels like she's leaving money on the table if she doesn't, right? Because their services are already paid for by those vested in tourism in the destination. If she doesn't tap into those free services, she has to go elsewhere and pay for them, and it actually costs their agency money. So you could really look at it as a pay it forward. You know, the tax dollars are being paid whether or not you use the services. So to, to Gary's point, um, not tapping into the DMO, you're really leaving money on the table. Right, and there's a lot of things that a DMO does for you too that, um, you know, uh, such as uh, photography. Maybe you need some good imagery of the, of the community. Maybe you need video footage. Um, there are marketing materials and support uh, that we can offer you at no cost uh, that will help make your meeting more successful. You just have to work with your DMO and say, do you have this? Do you have these materials that will uh, make me successful? And most DMOs do. And that, again, is an added value over and above all the other things that we do to consult with you to help book and, and make your meeting uh, happen. You know, I think it is just such an interesting business model that it's difficult for some to really get their heads around, you know, exactly why, you know, why we're, we're structured this way. Um, 
And I have um, another question that, in my experience as the planner and working with different CVBs, I noticed that the level of personalized service um, differs. I look to CVBs as partners in creating um, an amazing experience for their attendees. How can we, as planners, push the envelope with more CVBs to help produce something incredible with minimal resources? So what kinds of questions can we arm the planners with to really um, be able to convey to the CVDs what they're looking for? Well, I think, you know, again, it, we, we like uh, to really consider ourselves more in a consultant, uh, consultant's role than a sales role. And I think when you have the difference between the two is that, you know, our, our consultants really want to talk and listen uh, to what you've done in the past, um, what the goals of your particular meeting happen to be, uh, who the audience is, um, and and really kind of work to brainstorm and, and to be uh, your creative partner in helping craft those kind of unique experiences. You know, we hear all the time now is one of the things that people want is they don't want stuff. They want something unique. They want experiences that are memorable, experiences that they're going to be able to take back with them, that they'll be able to share on social media, that they'll be able to share word of mouth. Word of mouth now is the most important marketing tool any destination can have regarding either group or leisure. And I think the the idea here is that planners need to be able to you know um, uh, come to a DMO or a CVB, um, know what maybe makes that you that destination particularly unique, and kind of say, okay, well, you know what what are things that we can do that haven't been done before? Are there venues that uh, where we can meet? I mentioned you know the going to a home instead of just doing it always at a at a hotel. Um, you know, are there you know places on the beach? Are there um, are there areas within a theme park that we might be able to you know section off and and provide our our folks with something that truly they can't get on their own? And I think that's really what makes things very special is that people leave and they say, wow, I cannot believe they got us into whatever. And I can't believe they got so-and-so who lives in that community to kind of come and talk with us about it. Or we were able to, you know, go into a, a winery and have that back of the house tour that they don't offer to their customers. You know, being able to really get under the skin of a destination uh, and not only have a great meaningful program, but being able to go back and generate buzz factor because that's what we all want, right? We want everyone to leave saying, you know, that meeting, not only did I learn things and I met people and I engaged and we had great business, but boy, I had a, also a phenomenal time. And I got to see something in this community that if I was just vacationing there, I perhaps couldn't have done on my own. And a great DMO has a list of these kind of places. You just need to work with your, your DMO to kind of pull them out. And again, we want to make sure it's um, something that is reflective of what you have done or what the you know what your organization is about so that we can make sure that if there's a good fit that's our big thing is making sure that you know things work well that it is complementary to your goals and objectives of why you're meeting a particular destination you know i think um gary you you as dmos you know you see things uh, that that groups are doing all the time so I think one key question is like the planners can really tap into the CVBs is by asking them what have other events or other programs have done that have been really quite unique because there's nothing wrong with stealing an idea, right? No, um, I'm you know, a big believer in that. <laughs> <laughs> we do it all I the think, time in this office. <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, I think that, um, Terry, can I ask uh, maybe one or two more questions? Yeah, I think I, I'm so excited. I've been watching the numbers. I'm so excited for the number of people who have continued to stay online for q and I always see that. I hope I see that as indicative of uh, we've done a good job of engaging our audience. Well, the, the questions are still keep rolling in, so um, I, I want to still address, um, address them. So is there a benefit to uh, Gary reaching out to a DMO for a repeat group versus going direct directly to the hotel? 
Absolutely. Um, you know, we uh, a, a DMO uh, always wants to be able to continue to engage with a, a client that is happy and satisfied with the destination. But you know, make no mistake, destinations evolve, hotels evolve, um, things are different. If you haven't been in destination in a year or two, a lot can happen. Um, and you want to make sure that you're touching base with the DMO to make sure that if you had a great experience at a hotel, like, great, that's wonderful, we want to see you back, but you know, maybe there are things coming on down the road that you need to be aware of or there are changes within the destination. Um, you may not even know about uh, you know, changes uh, at the local airport and flight schedules and access. Um, so these things are always moving, they're always you know, um, in a very dynamic manner and you don't want to take anything for granted. Even if you've had a success in the past, you want to maybe sure, make sure you check in with the destination expert to make sure that they are, you know, you're up to date on everything that's going on so that you can calibrate accordingly or you know, just have peace of mind that, hey, everything is where, what it was, I can be assured of the same great meeting that I had last time. Yeah, I think there is two out of the rut. Too, Shima. Don't you think, Gary? It, it, it also makes sure that we yeah. don't, even if we return, we don't stay in the rut. We don't just redo the same meeting, right? right. And nor do your attendees. You know, like the attendee demands, uh, you really always want to stay on top and make sure that you're exposing them to the latest experiences of the destination. So, well put, Gary. Um, we talked a lot about the, um, the, the hotel tax and assessments. Uh, can a group opt out of this destination room tax or assessment fee? Um, usually not, and um, it's uh, it, it's usually a part of how again how DMOs are uh, are funded. So on certainly on room tax, that is a requirement of of local jurisdictions. Uh, that they have to collect those those fees, and then the uh, the other fees, whether it's a T bid or what have you, those are assessments that uh, the hotels have agreed to collect and and remit uh, to the DMO. Um, so they really are kind of uh, baked in the cake. Um, but um, you know there are other ways that you can negotiate and work with a, a DMO. But usually those fees are are, are pretty solid because. Um, again, that's how DMOs stay in business, is they need to be able to have a, a large uh, dependable funding stream. Uh, and that's why, uh, in fact, why the, these T-bids were created is that DMOs needed to be able to have a, a funding stream because sometimes governments, when they run into economic problems, sometimes take their room tax money away and uh, use it for other purposes, and then the DMO has to kind of scramble. So DMOs have had to kind of come up with uh, other ways to kind of Create a sustainable and reliable funding formula, uh, and that's you know that's why it's it's uh, important. But DMOs can work with you certainly in in other areas as, as well the hotels. Well, we we are at the top of the hour. There are several questions that we didn't quite get to, but our team will make sure we answer those specifically to those of you that have asked. So thank you, Gary. Nice thank job you. on all those questions. Appreciate it. It was an honor being with you all. I'll turn it over to you, Terry. Well, I'd just like to again thank Gary, thank Adam Sachs, thank uh, Chris Wessel at ePro, and mostly to just thank our um, webinar audience. You continue to grow strong and support um, our webinars each month, and we really, really appreciate that. Uh, you'll get a follow-up again with your CMP credit uh, certificate. You'll also get the link to join us for next month's webinar, uh, which is about mining gold in the destination. We're really going to invite uh, Steve Genovese from Austin. Many of you may have been at PCMA, and he's going to kind of give us a, a behind-the-scenes look at how you can really tap into destination gold um, and uniqueness. And, you know, I, I will close by saying that I was um, recently at RCMA, and Janice Smigas uh, with UUA said to our audience, when you give out generic information, you often get back generic responses. So my advice to planners who are working with DMOs and hoteliers is to not give out generic information. Give really good, rich information about all your attendees want and desire, and then expect in return really personalized uh, deliverable. All right, everyone, have a great day.